get closer. It's hard, this stuff is hard to see. The, the closer you are, poorer is the better for you because it's just so small. I need a script. <laughs> The Italian Navy Zara. And this one is the Bruins, a modern US destroyer. So what else? What I'll go through, and I do need a script, I'm sorry. Yep, there we go. I have a good head for radio, I'll tell you. And it's also really hard for them to like that. Um, the reason I bought two old ships, uh, the way they weather is completely different. Old ships, big slabs of steel, bent into shape, shoved on the side of the boat, pop riveted in, riveted in, welded in. Modern ships, that's probably about four bits of aluminium frame welded together. So aluminium is obviously going to write, rust different to how an old fashioned warship would be. So also planning scales, how things work, because a, um, so USS Gerald Ford, the biggest aircraft carrier the Yanks have at the moment, 337 metres. So over three football fields long. So you can't weather that the way you're going to weather like a tiger tank, which is like six metres long. It just works differently. So you see here, what? This is the, just the frame of the HMS Dreadnought. So above the water is obviously weathering above and below the waterline. I just kind of mucked this up as much as I could. The thing is when you get most ship models, they um, come with a smooth hull. They don't have, real ships didn't have smooth holes. It's just how much you have to look at them, how close you get to them to see what is visible. There are armour plates on something like some of the American ships that a human could stand on top of. It bulges out that much. So to create that in, um, in a ship, you need to start building up layers. The simplest way I'll do, I'll use like a simple like a rattle can primer and just put it in the garage outside on a trestle horse and go over it, come back, go over it, come back, go over it, come back, but I'll mask. So you can see this bit here. This is a two minute job, literally just for this. So that's a bit of masking tape and start building it up. Three or four trips over the top and suddenly I've got, actually I can feel the layers here. So later when I weather it, if I want to put a a chipping line on here where the paint may chip away where it rubs, that's where it's going to start from. Uh, okay. So then moving along, then I would put another overcoat of primer over the top of the primer. Well, I'll use like a dark red. So you, your complete undercoat, I would put a dark red, just sprayed on um, with an airbrush. So Product placement, you know, AK Red Brown works really well for that because it has a really nice dull coat when it finishes. Um, and there's a light spray of orange. The reason I do this because I'm going to do chipping. This is what the effect I want to come out from underneath. Does everyone know what chipping is? Yeah. I'll, I'll assume you don't know what chipping is? Okay. Chipping is where you use a chipping fluid, which I don't have any with me, um, or the hairspray effect. So over the top of that, I would then put a um, clear coat and I would then put a chipping coat, which is just the chipping fluid. Once that dries, it can take like 12 hours or whatever next day. Um, I'll then start painting over the top for my colour and you'll end up with, so this is my base coat. Let's see that working. Yeah. My base coat, a bit more orange on there. The chipping fluid goes on here. It looks a bit shiny here because I've just drowned it in it so I could get the effect in. Um, paint my colour over and then with a paintbrush, I can just activate it and start chipping away like you would, oh, people have done military models before. You just chip away to lose that um, paint to show the underside. Now, if I've 
taking it back to this point here, if I've chipped it properly and I've got a nice, nice uh, edge on it, I'll only get the edges because that's what I want. But it's also got to bring it back into shipping like what is going to rust? What bits are going to rust? Like it doesn't make sense, say, if we're talking about the Gerald Ford being 350 metres long, so a model in 350, which will be about that long, to have massive chips of paint off like that. It's just not going to happen. Um, but in the modern warship, in an old-fashioned warship, like World War, mid, or mid World War II or prior to that, the British Navy in particular, they've got pictures of uh, like Anson, which had lost nearly all its paint because they couldn't afford the enamels to put into the paint. So a few weeks at sea, the paint started to come off. So that's when you can really start to heavily weather it. The one thing that didn't, the, the British never uh, skimped on was this black line here, which is the bootstrap. The reason being, this is the highest wear area of the ship. It's where the water line meets. It's where you've got tenders kind of come alongside to refuel it, re-oil it, um, re-coal it, depending on the era of the ship. That's where it's going to hit. So anything that's got above the surface level of the ship is going to be affected. Um, so my process of building a ship doesn't mean it's correct. Is that, so I'll do below, I'll always put a bootstrap in first. Nice, heavy, thick uh, bootstrap. I'll mask that and leave the mask there. I'll come back to weathering it afterwards. And then you're looking at the era of the ship and the colour of the anti-fouling underneath. We'll put the... Um, whether it's going to be like a bright modern red for a modern warship, which will use good calculated paints to be anti, anti fouling. I'm not sure you know what that is. Um, to older warships where they didn't get much time away from out of port and they would spend the whole time being fixed up. When I did the Zara, um, I had a lot of Italians having a go at me saying, You've over weathered it. We never got our ships that dirty. Yeah, ship that dirty. The reason being because they never left the port. Um, this ship got sunk by uh, a Royal Navy and the Australians task force because the uh, Italians didn't have radar. So at night time, the, the British just came out and they just pounded them and they disappeared. So moving back on the, the un, under the hull, um, every ship has algae underneath it, every one. I know I've spoken to people on the Navy before. If you're at sea for a long time, you're going to get it, no matter how good it is. Uh, the Borondino, you'll see there's an old warship out there with the uh, anti-torpedo nets on the outside. That went from basically the Black Sea all the way around Europe to um, Japan for the Battle of Hiroshima in 1906. When the, when the battle actually happened, people from the shoreline who could see the Borondino said they could see the algae on the side of the ship growing. It had travelled such a long way and it built up such, um, such grunge. To make that grunge, um, easy things, just simple uh, Mr. Surfacer with a primer, just tapping it on. You say, I won't feel because I've already done it. Um, tapping it on along here and up to pretty much where the bootstrap's going to be. It's going to be green towards the where the waterline is because the green is where the sunlight hits it. The further you go underneath, it won't be as green. Uh, a simple remedy for that, if you want to, once you've done that, um, when it's wet, get a cotton bud. Tap a cotton bud on there and you'll get that algae effect. Once it's dried, just rub it off because the algae's not going to be that long. Then you've got a nice rough, rough texture. And on top of that rough texture, you can then put a green slime. Just a light wash, depending on how heavy you want to have it. This stuff, this stuff here um, dries really, really glossy. So you probably need, need to put a matte coat over the top of it so it's just not distracting from the rest of the model. Um, and that's up to you. To, and you can see here from the green, it can come up quite nicely. Um, sorry, one pause because I needed a script. Um, so, points of the ship that are going to wear here, where the anchors drop out. Even modern warships will have rust here at these islets where the anchors come down. Because the chances are the anchor hitting the side of the hull 
especially in a hurry, you're going to be quite high. So you're going to get chips there. And chips are going to make rust very, very quickly. Anyone know who's been in the Navy, particularly who's not been an officer, they basically said they're professional painters most of their career because all they do is paint a ship. So my wear points are going to be up along the, the top of the gunnels here where your hawser lines come in, which means the, the ropes are tied alongside, where another ship's going to hit it alongside if it's coming alongside it. Um, and that's where your rust points are going to be pushing through that. Um, pushing through that. So, for example, Just if you've seen Clayton's and this, there's no, there's no great mystique about this at all because armor modelers do it. It's the same kind of thing. I'm just going to chip on there. You see, I'm going to get a tiny little red edge. If that's the point here where something hits it, it's got to make sense in the scheme of how I do the model because a fist sized hole on the side of this hole. It's going to be like a pinprick. So as my predecessor has just done, from here, using your, your um, like rust streaks, positive rust, same kind of thing, if I just quickly go over where the hawsers horse come in. And I would usually use a paintbrush to do this as well. Just tapping on how it makes sense, how, the, how a um, metal chain is going to come through. I don't have my OptiVisor. So a lot of you will notice as you get older, you kind of need them. So this stuff lasts forever. I've probably built about 10 ships just with one of these. It's the level you should be, you know, not over rusting. Simple dirty white spirits. Just dropping some here and leaving it. That's an enamel. Once that's dried off a bit, I'll start doing streaking. Because it is such, the length of something like this takes such a long time, I can pretty much start here, finish here, with my just dropping on the enamel, and then I can come back with just the feathering and just running it down. I would have, sorry, I would have a clear cut under that. Yeah, I would. I'm kind of probably rushing ahead a little bit there. So, the drier the brush, the better. And running it down. You see, it looks sloppy there, but I'll probably do this 10 times. I'll probably go back and I'll redo it and I'll redo it and I'll redo it. I said, it's difficult. And it's going to dry like this, so without having a bit. If you just get a little bit of a streak there, I don't know if that's showing up or not, is that focusing? Yeah. Yeah. So. Also, masking tape is your friend. So if I want to do a line where I think an edge is going to be, because a lot of airbrushing, so if I want to airbrush in my panels, so you would do, say, for what's called oil keening, I would then put a line of masking tape here, put that chipping fluid on there so I've got a good straight line to work from, be that horizontal, horizontal, horizontal or vertical. 
So just pass it around. Just flip it over, you're not going to hurt it. It's, it's my mule. So the way I'll go is a dark red, an orange overspray, a clear coat, chipping fluid, colours and graduation, oil canning if necessary. Mod you know, everyone know what oil canning is? Okay, I'll go to oil canning in a second. Uh, filters, chipping and rust streaks. I'll go in that order. So whether I'm using my, um, I want to get my base coat down to look good first. And then, I'll ch and then if I'm going to put a clear coat over the top of that, I'll then chip it once the painting's done because that's where it's going to work. So if I'm going to put a, if I'm going to put a camouflage pattern in it, I'm starting from scratch all over again on the bit that I'm going to mask off. Uh, so if you put a dazzle pattern in, I will, I will do the whole base coat in one colour and then I'll mask it and I'll start again for the dazzle pattern over the top of that. And you can do multiple layers, you can chip multiple layers. You can put a, so if I put a dark grey, I can then put a clear coat over that, put chipping fluid to the undercoat. And then I'll put a lighter grey colour over that, chip it again. So you've got that, so it looks like the ship's been painted several times. Now, oil canning is what happens basically when you've got a, like a more modern ship like this is going to have oil canning because it's got frames as it moves along the hull. So those frames, the longer it spends at sea, the more stipples, stripples you'll see down the side of the ship because the metal is thin, it moves, it bulges, it's getting hit by the sea all the time. It's one, well, what looks like a big piece of metal floating in the ocean. Um, Oil canning is really, really easy. It'll come up very well. So you can see here you've got these colours, graduations. So that took me three minutes. Not because I'm particularly good, it's just there's a, certain, there's a process to doing it. So I will put a dark, say a dark grey undercoat and then using an airbrush with a nice thin level, I could put like a haze grey on here. See, none of us have brought airbrushes today because we're just going to make a mess. So I recently did the USS Zumwalt and the whole thing's oil canned. It's that long. So I would then spray that line there, a nice light colour. So it's really, really distinctive. Move it there, move it there so it dries. By the time that's dried again, I'll move to the next one and so on and so forth. Uh, horizontally, and horizontally and vertically. And I'd also put along the, the length of the ship from where your panel lines are going to be, your hull lines, however it is, what year it's going to be. Um, then once that's done, I will give it a lighter overspray so it fades into the distance. So next, pass that along. A 1700 ship cost bugger all as a mule. So whatever you want to do with it, like you can keep painting, you can strip it and go from there. Um, uh, decks, wooden decks. Um, most apart from something like this, which will have PE, uh, the back deck on this is PE and the fore deck is PE, photo etch. It's a pain in the ass to mask and paint because the paint lifts really, really well, no matter how well you try and prepare it. I will use the base plate for the PE. I will use um, nail polish remover to clean it back as well as I can. Once I've done the nail polish remover, I will then use the, probably a 50-50 mix of Tamiya uh, surface primer and Tamiya lacquer thinner so I don't lose the detail in the deck. And then I will put my other colours over there. My stipulations are grey. Uh, and then I'll put my decals down. Um, the problem is you have with decals is they can lift as well. I'd, I'd rather hand paint them in. Um, but if you're going to mask it, detack your masking tape first on the top of big pieces of PE because it will lift. Um, the older ships, I'm yet to see a model that comes out that um, has a good set of uh, planks on the deck that's not broken by a seam line and you can't fix them, you really can't fix them. Uh, so that's, that's an old off cut from a Yamato. Um, they're pre-chewed wooden decks, they don't like weathering. 
find, I find the only way I can really weather them, I have to give them a clear coat over the top. So then if you want to bring out your details, whether you want to put a wash or something like that, so pigments here just don't work. You just lose all the detail. These are just things I've practiced with over the years. So all those tiny little bits are going to, that you'll see if you haven't used wooden decks uh, just will pop out. There, so there's where we've got guns on the deck, and then you've got to lay that across the top. Um, best advice I can give putting down this put a clear gloss coat on your top deck because this will stick a lot better because they've got a horrible habit of popping up. So, all I will do then, I will use a thin shim, shim of off cut uh, photo wedge, I'll slide it underneath like the fingernail of it, and put the glue down and press it down because guaranteed it was always going to come up. And it's fiddly to work with. I only use P I use CA for everything. I use a thin, or I use like Zap. I'll use the green, which is the medium, or I'll use the very thin. The very thin for this stuff is quite good. Um, online, if I get asked questions, the main questions I get asked are, um, "How do you weather a ship?" And it's like saying, "Well, how do I put a V8 engine together?" You either it's something you've got to do yourself for a start. To figure out and get a steer. There's not much online about how to do how to do um, PE work for ships because it's, it's so small and it's like it's very hard to video on something like this or I'm, something I'm not going to demonstrate. But you need an oxidizer and a good PE bending tool. Um, annealing is really important for some of the thicker stuff. Tamiya has a horrible habit, as you know, um, of having stainless steel, which is really hard to bend. I'd rather just not use it. Um, Rigging and how to attach photo etch railings. Photo etch railings are hard to put on. There's yet, I'm yet to find a decent tool that will be good to put it on. It needs like a claw that will drop it on. Um, I will fully paint my railings first if I do railings, and then I'll put them on, then I'll touch it up. I'll just touch it with a tiny bit of thin glue just to seam in, and then just clean up the mess afterwards. That's a, you know, pretty much the best you can do. Um, or I'll use individual stanchions. I'll drill all the holes first, all the way along the hull. I'll put the um, I'll put the stanchions in there, and then I'll rig the rig it with denier line, so it looks like real stanchions. Because most ships don't have hard fixed hard fixed um, railings, only in certain places, and the rest will be wire. Particularly on the foredeck of a big ship, because on the foredeck you'll have um, the in the older ships. When they're using the big guns, they'll come down, they'll fall down. They're meant to fall down. Uh, sorry. So, um, you'll see the rigging on this one here, and I'll just bring it over. Even modern warships have rigging. Come and done a bit. So when I'm looking at the streaking on the side of the hole, there's it going to come up. Better off going that way. So that's aluminium. So it's only going to rust where the metal is. Aluminium is not going to rust, but it's going to be grungy. So report the refueling ports. So around the midships. So if you get fuel oil comes over the side, that's where it's going to come over. Um, and you're still going to get your metal fittings on top. There's still metal, and they're still going to rust. And I imagine if you're spending a long time at sea, you're probably not going to want to hang over the side of the ship to be fixing stuff up. Your anchor areas here, that's going to attract rust because you've got metal on metal. Maybe with a spray down desk, it's going to lift it up. And where your anchor ports are, you're going to get those fittings on the side of the ship that are still metal. Then you get streaked down the side of the ship. And essentially it looks good. I like to think it looks good anyway. Um, you saw, I saw an image of one of the British warships that had just spent a few months in the North Sea, came back, it was covered in rust. And it was just that streaking rust. And the streaking rust is going to best create it with, as I said, make that small chipping point, then run it down the hull, and then I'd put an orange on across the top. So if you're looking at, say, a 1350 submarine, you can rust that as much as you want because they would have spent a lot of time at sea. They would have been beaten up a lot. 
and you know, imagine coming back and even the album. Um, have I answered enough questions that far on us? Questions? Anyone? No? Hello? Isn't it tipping? When you tip the put that down, what do you use to bring tip and stuff? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, spirits or what's, what's... The chipping fluid itself. The, I, I use chipping fluid. Yeah. yeah. Which, which I was thrown off an airbrush yeah. and with a, like a number three, so it's quite a large volume coming out it needs to dry for the probably you want to activate it after 12 hours so then once that's dry i will then put uh, my normal colors over the top whatever colors i want to use whether it's going to be layerized and then it's just a little bit of water it's water activated yep. that's that's how it works um so i just dip it in water and just rub but i'm also very conscious if i want a line and i don't want it to that's when i would mask i would mask above the bits that i don't want to chip so I'm getting a nice panel line there. So if on an older ship like the Zara here, which is going to have panels all the way along the side of it, if I want to pick on one panel, I'll pick on one panel, but I'll mask it out. And then I might change the colours on it with the airbrush, and then I might redo it and redo it and redo it. So I've got several different variations. And I said, because she was what the equivalent of a hanger coin didn't do much. So it's not going to be that bad. But if I'm going to look at a, a US ship that's been... In 1945, early 1945, it spent most of its career out in the Pacific Ocean being beaten up badly by storms and everything else and tenders coming alongside and a whole bunch of young men who really don't give a shit about the, how the outside of the ship is treated. It's going to be pretty beaten up. Above decks maybe to keep them busy, but not down the side of the hull when they're going between island and island and island. And there's good video, there's good colour video on YouTube of how their ships looked then. And they were really, really rusty, which is a good challenge, something to do. Um, anything? I'll move on to rigging next. Before I did uh, metal ships, I did wooden ships. So with wooden ships, there's so much stuff out there how to rig a ship. Um, because you need, basically being a wooden ship builder, you need to learn how to do woodwork and then you need to learn how to make ropes and then you need to learn how to tie ropes and then you need to learn how to go on from there. You can't do that with ships this size. It just doesn't work. They are essentially, it's too hard. You're not going to get, but what you do need is your belaying points. So whilst one of my yards has fallen off this, so here's one I prepared earlier because I'll need it. Foremast, mainmast, mizzen mast. Um, these things are falling off because I normally, you normally get little, there's little brackets that go with them when you make these masks. Now, if I'm going to use the type of Denia line that I would use, and it's just Infinity line, there's several different companies. I have noticed I used some stuff on the Dreadnought years ago, it's starting to go off a little bit. But if you're going to rig a ship heavily, do not store it in the sun because it will degrade. Now, can you see that line there? Yeah, that's why I'm not going to use that for a demo because you're not going to pick up anything. This stuff, easy line. <coughs> Same kind of stuff. So. And any warship model or wooden ship model is going to know this. Your sequence is always going to be moving inboard to outboard. Um, it's not going to have rat lines because even these things are not good. They're still going to have stays. They need stays because when the ship rocks in the ocean, stuff's going to move. They need to keep it steady. So yeah. I use, and I got them, didn't I? I use acupuncture needles for use PE. So you get a pack of like 500 bucks for 10 bucks. And I find they're the easiest ones for me to use for um, dropping my CA onto my model because then I'll use a cigarette lighter, burn it off, and I start all over again. Everyone's got their own thing. People, some people use toothpicks. Everyone is professional PE applicators, which I don't really care about because I just don't think they work as well as a... That, and when you're working in this scale, 
the, the minutity of the tiny little bits of um, PE on the gloss from the super, the super glue is going to really stand out. So given one of my yards has now sacrificed itself to the god of photo etch, I will... This stuff dries really quickly. So I'll let it sit. And so it doesn't prove a fool of me, let it sit properly. It should dry in like 10 seconds. And it's not going to do it, just prove me wrong. Probably because this denny line is a little bit thicker than the thin black stuff. So, a backstay, and naval people here, correct me if I'm wrong. The good thing about using this denier line is when you knock it, and you always do, it doesn't break anything off. If you're using a solid line, like using wire, you knock it, and you're going to knock it every time, whether you're using a set of tweezers, something's going to go off into the distance. So there, that's stuck now. So let that sit there. And I can knock it. It'll move quite comfortably. If you get super glue on the denier line, it will curl up like that. But you can still just pull it straight. So if you're building something like a HMS Victory that's got like 100 kilometres of rope on it, very different for any other ship. So your back stays, and I would move that along, and you'll have your lower yard, which will sit here. You'll have a back stay there. But it's like anything. You're going to do your research first as, as to how you want to... So who here has never used any line? Okay, come up here, have a go. Sit beside me. Come on, have a go. So, yeah, just squeeze down there. Uh, squeeze down the line. Just have a bit of a dip in there. There's your super glue there. Yep. So touch it, stick on your line wherever you want to. So just do the. So what I want you to do is run one from there. Yep. To there, to there, to there, to there. Right on the tip of each mast. Yep, right on top of each mast. So have the confidence to do it. Just. So the important thing is getting your initial belaying point first. Your initial belaying point is where it's going to sit. So as long as that's nicely anchored there, yep. makes it easier to go to the next point, to the next point, and the next point. Just a little dab of that. Yep, just needs it. The smaller the dab, the better, because the quicker yep. it'll dry. Yeah, right, yep. Yeah. Here's your line. You'll find um, when you're using the really thin stuff, it's super, super quick. It'll dry super quick. But it's also hard to see, so you'll need that little bit of white paper behind you. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you go for off. Yeah. I'll use a razor. Or you can get, um, there are PE or photo wet belaying uh, turnbuckles, which I prefer to use, because then I can fix them. I will fix in your planning phase you're going to have rings. I will put rings all over the deck. So this will blow to a ring point. This will blow to like something like this where you've got your, your signal flags will go down to a blank point. I will make sure 
in the design phase of it, I will have a blank point for each line to come through. You've got to know how many lines are going to come through. But the Americans on these things have these massive great US flags off them. And I'm sure they only use them when they're coming into port, but it's something I really couldn't be asked doing. So but don't be afraid to put tension on it and just let it sit. Um, so Zara there, when I built Zara, I, you can say I've just used cigarette paper to, to um, make the, it's not the world's best, it was my first attempt uh, to make the sailcloth on top of it. And then all I did, I was just with white glue, cigarette paper, and then I can just use a dirty wash to tone it down a little bit. What you can't see underneath that, um, all the way along both sides of the hull, I've got a nice stamp, staunch and stuck right into the deck, and I've got wire, very thin copper wire running across, making a lattice work underneath so it sits up properly. Jeez, this is okay. it's full on, yeah. What? That's all right, don't worry. Well, you can't bit, break it. Bit of a curl on it. But if you hold it tight, it won't. It'll be right. Oh, you've got trash in the model, right? Doesn't matter. I said, it took me 10 minutes to throw this up and I'll hold it even. Um, Yeah. yeah so while Matt's having an adventure, what other questions we've got? Yep. Uh, you, they generally don't belay to the same point. Like if I'm looking at, in the easiest way is when you look at tall ship rigging, and some things haven't changed. So if I'm looking at the yards, the stays, and things like that without, say, for instance here, right? Each one will, is that coming up all right? It will all have its own, these are, uh, it all have its own point it goes to. So you very rarely should it um, go over the top of each other. You might have it, and I said it's a planning point, that when you look at how these are all cabled up here, um, that's because of the tall ship. On a modern ship, you are just as likely to have a ring bolt on each side. And with a lot of modern, the really good PE sets, you will have the mast set will come with it. And on the mast set, you'll have, uh, you'll have the, the, the horses that will hold the yard arm across. It will have the ring bolts fore and aft and to the sides. So your stays will go down. Um, I did this just purely for have confidence in your ability. So that's easy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's tricky. But yeah. Yeah, it's tricky the first time. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. But it's impressive how well that holds. That yeah, and it, and it holds. Yeah. We said well, that's quite thick. So the thin stuff will bend even further down. But so what, what glue is that? That's just super glue. Super glue. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, where was I? Oh, thanks. That's right. Thank you. Um, your when you're doing something really, really complex and there's a lot of lines it's really easy to get lost in the detail. So that's why you do need to plan ahead as to where I'm going to put this line, where this is going to go, where your belaying points are going to be, and not being afraid to fail. Because sometimes you're the only one that knows that line needs to be there. It's like when you build, like, they have PE sets that come out and like there's bits that you can't even turn your um, my fingernail says, I'm just not going to use it. It's just too hard. And it doesn't achieve anything. All I'm going to do is make a mess of the model while I'm doing it. Um, so, so, with, so that's pretty much it. I don't, it's, it's such a complex thing. But any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I even brought, thank you for that. I brought crystal clear. Insulators. So when we're looking at this, so if you don't know what an insulator is, when they use radio wires, particularly on these older ships, You'll have these lines that run between the masts and they're isolated so they can run a radio wire up there so you've got a high wire. So, easiest thing to do for that, and I would normally do this with a pin, it's just this hasn't been, this needs a bit of water. So, on here, and don't worry about the scale of it, build it up. So, that's going to be a radio wire. That's your insulators. 
Just come forward and have a look, if you want. And I could probably do it on the camera, which would make sense, wouldn't it? So that'll be my insulators. So if I've got four lines running across here, I'll put four lines of insulators like that. And if I need to come back and make it thicker, I'll, make, I'll come back and make it thicker. So then what would normally happen, you'll have a radio room down here, and you'll have a wire running from this inside of the insulator line down to wherever the radio room is. So if you see a big battleship, battleship might have four or five lines running across, and then once you've got, they'll, then those lines will then run down. I mean, I've done the Emden. The Emden had the same thing, because back in those days, there was no satellite. It was all, it was all radio. Just a quick. Use it for like windows and stuff like that. It, it dries clear, yeah. But with this, what I would do, I'd probably, probably come back and either paint it white or black. It's up to you. What do you want to do that? That's it. Is quite simple and it, it looks so much better when people are doing aerial lines on this. It can also be used to represent lower down on a small scale. That's just your blocks. Because you'll have a block underneath where they're going to tighten it on. So like a, a stropping block and something like that, and one 350, it's just not going to be visible. So that can be used to represent it. We good? Okay. Close it, have a look, have a play, have a, do, have a go at this if you want. I don't mind. So I made this up specifically so people could have a play with it. So if you want to have a go? Yeah. Huh? What? what? Can you go over the photo web stuff again? Okay. Um, so when that bit there is all photo etch, it's a photo etch stick on deck. So if I'm going to stick that on, obviously you've got to glue it on. Now the issue is once you're handling stuff, and you're always going to have oils on your fingers. So once you've got them down there, you need to clean that up. And I'll just use on a cotton bud, I'll use nail polish remover and to clean it up. And then to put a primer coat down, I want it as thin as possible without losing detail. So I'll use it airbrushed. I'll use a mix of Tamiya thinner and the uh, uh, Tamiya, the, the, square, the square bottle of the Tamiya. X28. Yeah, is that what it is? Yeah. Sorry? I've never used a metal primer. Well, I could be wrong, and I could have an absolute revolution, but I'll... I'll hey. Yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah I, I have found, and I've done a lot of photo work now, I've never... The, tam, the mix of Tamiya Thinner and the mix of Tamiya um, uh, Primer works perfectly well. Because it brushes, it's airbrushes really well, so I'm getting a nice, smooth surface on there. Uh, the secret is detacking. So I absolutely stuff this four deck here because it's because i do um when i put the decals down a whole lot lifted up so i was down to bare i was down to bare brass again so i had to completely redo it so then it's just remasking and going through that pain and then weathering it again because you know ships are going to get salt on them so i can i can cover a few sins with that um but this this was a this is a pontos set and it's really hard to use because this whole stack assembly here is all pe so you've got to sand back the, the frame underneath so it's, the tolerances are like less than a mil to get that on there. And then I've got little wire bits that stick out of them for your aerial bits on that. But the detail is amazing. But the guy who's designing it is designing on a computer, he's not building it. So that, that's how it comes out. So it probably becomes that little bit more complex or more so than it needs to be. Because you can't tell. You just cannot tell. Unless I'm using an Optivisor, I'm just not going to see it. But you see that constant streaking comes up. It looks a lot nicer than a dull grey ship. Do you have a preference for the PE? Do you use like mixed pop-offs? Do you have a preference for that? Um, I, I like Pontos. Pontos is really good. It depends who does the right set for what. Yeah, yeah. I think um, Edward stuff I don't like. It's, I think they haven't advanced enough. You've got the old what? You've got the old white ensign model stuff, which is very, very, very dated now. Once upon a time, it was the only show in town. Um, some of the Asian stuff is really good. Um, I'm about to redo a Dreadnought, and with that, I've got the, I've got the Pontoff set, but I'm also going to do a lot of uh, MicroMaster 3D print stuff on there. So if you... <clears throat> 
So if I just grab that and hit it to you, that's the 3D printed gun. Oh, wow. That, and that whole thing, yeah, whole thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's one piece. Oh, no, the barrels are slot in. Yeah. But, so that, and very similar for painting that bit of painted 3D. So if you want to just grab a barrel, pass it around. So similar for priming that, if you've got the wave lines, the, the wave lines can, um, you'll have, you can sometimes get wave lines in here from the printing process. So a tiny bit of um, Tamiya thinner on a cotton bud, very dry, you can just rub them out, rub them out, it just disappears. So the lack of thinner, yeah. And then uh, same, same process for P, I will then spray this with a 50-50 mix of Tamiya thinner and Tamiya primer. And then take it from there. It's, it's a, it really is the future of stuff in this scale. Continuing this is just pretty much one continuous print. So the scale is amazing. Um, and I suppose you can say, well, <clears throat> am I cheating? Or am I like, well, if I'm, if I'm painting a bus, people can paint a beautiful bus because it's their painting ability, not the ability of the creature underneath. So, of course, of course, is what you prefer. At the end of the day, you do you. So that's what it comes down to. We good? Okay. How do I turn this off? <laughs> so when you're saying about the, the ultra-wide stuff, mostly I'm doing like really small stuff, like 300 scale for that. Yep. Um, would you recommend that same ultra-fine black for doing rigging for tall ships or? Uh, for rigging the tall ships at what scale? Uh, like 12400? Oh, yeah. Easily, yeah, yeah, really, really. If you come up and have a look at it, it's. Just get that from like Amazon or? Uh, Hobbies, uh, B and A Model World has it. Um, there's all. It's thinner than I've only rigged one so far, which I just did with like cotton. That's way too thick, but. Um, but there is thinner. Than, there is thinner than this. Oh wow! Yeah, I think that's from that looks about right. Because then. Um... Yeah, I've got a whole box full of this stuff, which I will use on different parts of the ship. So if I'm using a mainstay on a battleship, it's going to be big. It's going to be a thicker bit. If I'm going to use something, if I'm to, I'll have different shapes for my um, signal flag lines. I'll be small. So, yeah. So and there's different. Thank God, there's different colours now. So you want beige. So if you look at some of the, you want a line on the ship. It's not going to be black and it's not going to be um, white. Um, it's going to be beige. This takes colour really well too. It does take colour. Acrylic paints I paint it with all the time. So it does if you want to use colours on there. Does that ruin the springiness? No, it doesn't. Actually, I think if anything, it protects it. Because depending how tight you've got it as well. I mean, if you can only have a look at the rigging on this, because you can't really see it unless you get close, um, that's just this kind of fine line. You've painted it. Um, there's some parts I will have painted, yeah, if I need to, if it comes across as grey. Um, and it's really easy to fix. If I stuff it up, I'll use a razor, I'll just cut it off. And put another piece down. But go long, always go long and trim down. I think we're done. Well, some, someone coming on after me, so I, I should move. Oh, one thing um, I'll give Pete Burford a plug for using PE. These are the best tweezers I've ever used. It doesn't ping. PE doesn't ping when you use this. They're, they're the um, uh, ceramic ends on them. Yeah. So don't use them for levering because they will snap. Yeah. But uh, these hold. These are the best things I've found for holding PE. Okay. Yeah. It's um. Okay. Oh, Pete Burford's got them out there. That's where I bought it last year. I'm so much happier using these things because everyone loses shit. Sorry, don't swear I'm on. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark. Sorry. Right. Good. Yeah. Yeah.